Hi, I'm Gary and this is EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be looking at the government side of electric vehicles and decarbonisation. This season of the podcast is sponsored by ZapMap, the free-to-download app that helps EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. Before we start, I wanted to ask whether you thought that the Q&A session from a week or two back worked for you. We did cover quite a few topics in quite a short period of time. But if you do like that sort of format, let me know. I'll get one scheduled in for the next season. Our main topic of discussion today is, well, it's a conversation with the Transport Decarbonisation Minister, Anthony Brown. We're fortunate to have the Minister on the podcast today, and I wanted to take this opportunity to have a bit of a discussion about various aspects of the government's approach to decarbonisation, especially with the different policies and regulations that are currently in place. Uh, Welcome to the show, Minister. For those that don't know you, could you introduce yourself and tell the listeners what your role is, please? So I'm Anthony Brown, and I am Minister for Aviation, but more importantly here for decarbonisation of transport and the future of transport. So in terms of decarbonisation of transport, obviously a key part of that is the moving to zero emission vehicles. So I spend a lot of time on the promoting electric vehicles in particular, but with technology neutral, electric charge point rollout, but also I deal with sustainable aviation and also anything to do with airports and airlines comes under me as well. Okay. Now, before we go any further... Can I just ask you, do you drive electric vehicles yourself or in the family drive one? So my last two cars have been a hybrid electric petrol vehicles and my ministerial car is an electric vehicle, but I want to buy, I'm in the process of researching a full electric vehicle. Fantastic. Now, obviously, we have a lot of overlap in your area of responsibility and my listeners. So can I ask you a little bit about the plan for drivers? Talk to me about that and your department's role in it, please. Yeah, well, there's lots There's lots about the plan for drivers. This is really just looking at how we're helping motorists generally, and a lot of them fall outside my remit, actually. just There's, a, there's another minister for roads, Guy Opperman, who makes sure that all the roads are fit to drive on. And there's there's a whole range of different things in there, including like 20 mile an hour zones and so on. In terms of the electric vehicles and decarbonisation of transport, there's various elements in there about connection to the, the grid, which is really important. One of the key barriers on the charge points is actually being able to connect them to the electricity grid. I mean, it's a lot of charge point operators and that we made various quite sort of detailed proposals in there and, and speeding up the installation of charge points. So in terms of simplifying the licensing regime, so-called Section 50 licenses and turning them into permits. And basically I've gone through with the charge point operators all the barriers that they have and trying to see what we can do to remove the access of that. I can talk in more detail about that if you want, but a lot of it was put in the plan for drivers. Now, in particular in there, there's a, a section that says new measures to support electric vehicle drivers from the government's plan for drivers of law, including grants for schools, cash for councils and new proposals to boost charge point numbers. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Expand on that, please. Yeah, so we've spent about £2 billion so far promoting electric vehicles through various grants and schemes, and some of it's been direct to people buying vehicles. I mean, we, we don't, we no longer have a direct grant for buying electric, ordinary electric cars, but actually we still have them for vans and motorbikes and wheelchair accessible cars. The, we've also been giving a lot of grants to accelerate the rollout of electric charge points. And the, so a lot of that's in the, the so-called Levy Fund or Levi Fund, which is the local electric vehicle infrastructure fund that goes to local authorities. And this is really trying to accelerate the rollout in the parts of the country where there aren't so many charge points at the moment. And that's been incredibly popular with local authorities. I've visited various of them that have started installing that scheme and that will have a dramatic impact in many parts of the country. But we've also got schemes for schools that you mentioned to encourage the charge points in schools. And that's been very, very popular. We're rather surprised at the take up of that. But that's great. Also for people who don't have have off-street 
off-street parking. So two-thirds of homes roughly in the UK do have off-street parking, and then it's easier. You can install your own charge point in your home, and you can charge your car right there and then when you park it. But actually, one-third of homes roughly don't have off-street parking. What do they do? So a lot of them, they're obviously close to the road, and they could put a cable out to the road, and that's so that's cross-pavement solutions. And we've got a we've started a grant for that to help people do that. And actually, there's lots of new systems now. We can have a little like a little gully with a little cover on it, so there's no trip hazard across the pavement. But also, you've got to get local authorities to be comfortable with that. And some of them are. Some of them are going through a sort of a discovery process, shall we say? And then there's there's other grants that we have for, like for if you're in rented accommodation and the landlord's not that keen to install the charge point because of the cost and they don't get the benefit. So we've got grants for that. So there's a range of different grants, and we keep them under review the whole time to look at where there's most impact. We don't want to obviously waste valuable taxpayers' money funding something that's going to happen anyway. And generally, if things are commercial and they're taking off, then that's absolutely great. And, and a classic example of that is that there are lots of charge point companies in the, in the UK. They've got about six billion or more to invest in charge points and they're rolling them out, but they tend to go for the, the higher end premium charge points, the sort of rapid and ultra rapid uh, charge points around the country. And that's great. But then there are ga- there are sort of gaps in the market, as it were. And so we've also got the rapid charge fund, which is for pr- primarily aimed at motorway service stations. So we a lot of motorway service stations are absolutely fine, but some of them are in parts of the country where they've got very limited electricity and they can't install the charge points because they haven't got the electricity. And it's in can be incredibly expensive to connect the motorway service stations to upgrade the connection to the national grid. And it's then not commercial for the motorway service stations to install charge points. So we're using the rapid charge fund to, for those areas to improve connectivity to those areas that wouldn't be commercially viable otherwise to install charge points. So there's a whole range of different schemes. And also working with just helping those, encouraging those who would otherwise be interested. For example, I've been speaking to a lot of the supermarkets. I've written to them, to the chief executive saying, you know, have you thought about installing more electric charge points? Some of them are doing a lot, others not doing quite so many, but they all seem to be on the ball now. It's just an obvious thing. Lots of households around the country have a weekly shop in the supermarket, bring your car on, charge it up while you do your half hour shop or 20 minute shop or whatever. And, uh, you know, retail parks is another obvious area where people drive to a lot and they park for a while to have more charge points there. But those are all probably all commercially viable. So there's no real role for the government there to issue grants. It's more about just encouraging take up because we are on a journey here. I mean, a lot of the complexity is the fact that we just haven't done this before. We haven't had a big new infrastructure installation for you know 100 years or so since we installed electricity around the country or maybe the gas. And so like in local authorities, there's a, you know, there's in, in many local authorities, there's very limited experience or expertise on this. They, that the That is the, the main barrier. And so actually one of the things we've done is funded, we've got a capability fund, as we call it, where we've actually hired and trained 150 people to act as electric vehicle charge point procurement experts for local authorities. So they know that the whole regulatory and commercial and legal regime. And they just, they literally go and work with the local authorities to help them work out how to you know, procure and install the charge points. There's many different models, there's many different sort of legal questions about it. And if you haven't done it before, then for the local authorities, it, it can be quite difficult. So it, as I say, we're sort of re- identifying where all the different barriers are and then removing them, building up capacity and uh, accelerating the rollout. And the good news is, you didn't ask about numbers, and I'm sure you know about this because you follow it really closely, but there's last month there were two i think it's 2600 charge points installed the, the highest the record number of any any month in history and we're we're now up nearly 60,000 public charge points in the UK up 49% on last year so it really is going exponential now yeah there there's some superb improvements being made from a charging point of view and i think it's excellent to to see that and the role that the government is playing in that can i just loop back to the 150 individuals that are working with the local councils. Are they doing that on a specific council basis or are they available for any council that needs that uh, that assistance? So we've offered the assistance to all councils and the individuals are working for individual councils, if you see what I mean. They're not, they're not in a sort of call centre somewhere. <laughs> they go, because they, 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 the councils need the expertise in-house and to liaise with, they'll have the councils have their own roads teams, they'll have their own different, their own commercial divisions. So the, the individuals need to know how to operate within the councils. And uh, we're paying for the, I mean, helping identify and hire the individuals, but paying for the training to be able to bit build up the internal capacity. Some councils are in very good positions. They, some have been doing this for a while and they've got great expertise. In fact, a lot of them are learning off each other. And that's one of the things we're doing. We're, we're you know, encouraging them all to talk to each other and learn how to do things. So we're trying to standardize things a bit because one of the complaints we've had, the councils have very different legal frameworks 
from one, between one council and another council. And it's and it, not for any particularly rational reason. It's just they haven't tried to make it sort of have a sort of more systematic approach. So one of the things we're doing is issuing guidance and sort of a pro forma legal documents, etc. Which obviously the councils can vary if they want to, but they don't have to come up from scratch with their lawyers to work out what they sh- what they need to do. Can I quote you from the foreword for the plan for drivers? It says that. Cars' environmental impacts are often held up as a reason for anti-driver measures, but the shift to cleaner vehicles makes this increasingly unjustified. We can decarbonise and maintain our freedoms. Zero emission vehicles are better for the planet, for the neighbourhoods they drive through, and for the people who use them. Now, notwithstanding what we've already discussed today, I think there is a general perception that the government is not doing anywhere near enough to make the decarbonisation happens. So, for example, VAT on public charging is still four times that of home charging, despite there being at least two budgets that have taken place since it was mooted that the, the rate should be reduced. Furthermore, there's been no increase in the main fuel duty rate since January 2011. Now, talk to me a little bit about reconciling the, the issues about being in a government that keeps fuel tax unchanged for the whole of its tenure thereby encouraging more people to drive fossil fuel cars. But you're leading a department that's promoting decarbonisation. What sort of discussions and, and conflicts are you having with other departments, such as the Treasury? So the, the point about fuel duty is just that obviously there are a lot of people who live in rural areas who don't have electric cars. And you know, until recently, the ranges of electric cars may not have been good enough for them. And the, and we don't want to penalise people living in rural areas. And that's is a very, I have a rural constituency and people completely depend on their cars to go to work and to shop and so on. Get, you know, understandably frustrated about duty going up inexorably. So that, that's, that's a sort of help for them generally. The, as I said earlier, that we have spent £2 billion so far, which is quite a large sum of money, promoting the rollout of charge points and electric vehicles generally. It's a grant to the people buying electric vehicles of different forms and, and subsidies for the the charge point installations where they're, where they're not commercial. Could we do more? I mean, obviously, we can always do more, and we're always reviewing different policies. So you mentioned the VAT on charge points. So this is a point that's raised to me very frequently, and it is obviously a treasury policy. You're right, it's 5% on domestic electricity, it's 20% on non-domestic electricity. And all I would say is that, that you know the treasury keeps tax policies under review. And there are many different considerations, not, le- not ne- least treasurers need to raise money to pay for public services like hospitals and schools. But uh, yeah, all, all taxes are kept under review. And in fact, you found some of the others, what, what we do is we judge it where, how close the, the market is to, to, to take off, as it were. So we, we had zero tax uh, vehicle excise duty while electric cars were in you know, a very, very small market share. They're now the, the generosity on the vehicle excise duty is now, you know, it's now for the sort of first year rather than permanently. But we also have a, a huge, massive discount on the tax if you're buying through a salary sacrifice scheme or as a corporate company car scheme, which is incredibly advantageous. And that's, uh, uh, you know, part of the reason why many people are buying their electric vehicles through salary sacrifice schemes because of the, the tax benefits of doing that. So the, the, the support for the government is in many, many different ways. And again, I should say just the figures. I mean, actually, last month we sold 48,000 electric cars, which is the the biggest ever in any one month in the UK. And for the first three months this year, we've actually now uh, become the largest electric vehicle market in Europe. We've overtaken Germany. So we sold 84,000 314 electric cars in the first three months this year is up nearly 11% compared to last year. And, and as I say, now bigger than Germany, France, and Italy. Fantastic, those figures. It's really good. I, I saw the chart that you were talking about where we'd, uh, we'd top the European rankings. And it's, it's always great to, uh, to get figures like that. It, it really justifies some of the work that we're doing here. Talk to me about your linkages with Charge UK. I know you spoke recently with former guest of the past, Chris Pateman jones their chair. Yeah, no, I've had a few bilateral meetings with them. I've done some roundtables with their members. I've done, I've done, I've been doing a lot of roundtables with lots of different people in the, who are interested in electric vehicles, including sort of car manufacturers, the charge point operators, the, the motorway service stations that I mentioned earlier, local authorities. I've been doing as much engagement as possible. Charge UK is a, a trade association. I meet many different trade associations. They, they serve a very useful function in terms of getting views from across the sector. You know, the many different types of 
charge point operators, they've got different concerns. Sometimes they've got the same concerns and Charge UK helpfully sort of helped distill it all down. They had a particular like manifesto, if you want uh, to call it that, sort of barriers to rolling out charge points, which they published last year. And it's, and it's helpful for government to see what the industry views are. And the, the, you know, what I said to charge point operators is that what the barriers are, and sometimes barriers will be there for that are actually, and that, that it's right that it, that they're there. But often the barriers are just for historic reasons that basically the whole regulatory and legal framework was not designed for rolling out charge point infrastructure across the country in actually incredibly rapid speed. It was, it was there for when there were, when we, we were rolling out electricity a hundred years ago. So, so one example of that is, which Charge UK have highlighted several times, is the, the licenses to dig up the pavement. So you don't want any, any old company just to be able to dig up the pavements and because the pavements be in a terrible state and they wouldn't be put back properly. So you, we li- we license the companies that are allowed to do that. And basically it's electricity companies and water companies and, and gas companies. And the and then they can then have permission to dig up the pavements. And, and we were changing the regime. So it'll include charge point operators as well so that they can, they'll basically be approved to dig up pavements. And that's just, it reduces costs for them. It massively speeds up the process for them. And it's just one example of basically how the the whole the regulatory system was designed for the status quo before this new infrastructure that we're rolling out. So we have to basically re-engineer large parts of our regulatory and legal framework. And we are, we've done some of that. We're still in the process of doing some of it, but it's, it is a work in progress. If I might play devil's advocate for a little while, what do you say to those who put forward the point that if EVs were good, you wouldn't need government incentives to make people buy them, which obviously could also apply to things such as subsidies for charge points? What what do you say to that? So the, I mean, the intervention of the government is is highly unusual. So we've got the zero emission vehicle mandate, where we've actually stipulated market shares, as you obviously know, to twenty two percent this year and rising to eighty percent by twenty thirty, and then a hundred percent by twenty thirty five. And there's really no other area where the government says, right, this is the market share that the manufacturers must sell. And we've put lots of flexibilities in there. We've done it in conjunction with the industry, and I, I don't want to sort of play down how challenging it is, but fundamentally they support it. And the reason for that market intervention is because climate change is the biggest market failure in history, as the as um, Nick Stern, the former chief economic advisor, the government said, or chief scientific advisor, that actually the it's clearly the reason why cars developed in the way they were is that petrol was is, is and diesel is an amazingly effective power source, and we can dig it out of the ground very easily. But there is a long long term damage to the planet doing that, and that damage is paid for by the whole of humanity, and not just by the, the not particularly by the people burning petrol. And that is a market failure, and uh, so the the solution to a market failure is to for the government to intervene. But actually, there's a very important role and indeed lesson here for the government, which is to force the pace of change of of technology, and uh, which is what we're doing with electric vehicles. I've got no no doubt that zero emission vehicles generally, but in particular electric vehicles are are the future for all sorts of reasons, not just climate change, but they're they're fabulous to drive. They're they're quieter. They don't have the air pollution issues, and so on and so forth. And it would have taken a lot longer to get there if the government, and not just the UK government, because actually, you know, countries around the world are doing this, didn't force the pace of change of it. And, and that's important for industry because they then know, they can see the direction and they are investing, you know, in varying degrees from different companies, but they're investing huge amounts developing the technology and improving the battery technology, not just adapting existing internal combustion engine cars for electric use, but actually now designing electric cars from scratch, which makes them a lot more efficient and effective and drivable. And but they can only justify those billions of pounds of investment because they they can see the direction of travel. And if we just left it to the market and said, oh, we'll just carry on doing whatever you want to do, then there just wouldn't be that scale of investment and there wouldn't be that change. Minister, you're responsible also, I believe, for aviation in the UK. So link the two areas for me, transport and decarbonisation. And I understand you've got a pilot's licence. I do. I do. I have a uh, private pilot's licence that unfortunately is kind of expired because I'm I'm at that situation where when I've got the time to do it, I don't have the money. And when I've got the money to do it, I don't have the time. Um, That's off to the trouble in life. If we look at aviation overall... There is really only one way to reduce the carbon footprint from flying, and that is to fly fewer planes and fewer flights. Do we really need, for example, 30 plus return flights from London to New York 
every day. So I would dispute that the only way to reduce the impact of flying is by, to have fewer flights, because actually there are lots of things we can do to reduce emissions and substantially reduce emissions without reducing the number of flights. So, and in fact, in the government, we we don't think we're in the business of telling people not to fly and not to go on holiday and not to do business trips and so on. So the, the biggest impact is, is sustainable aviation fuel. And we will very shortly be publishing two documents on that. And the first is the mandate, which requires airlines to, or in fact, the fuel suppliers to produce 10% SAF by 2030 years time. So 10% sustainable aviation fuel. And that reduces emissions by about 70%. And we're also trying to encourage a, a SAF production industry, sustainable aviation fuel production industry in the UK. And it could be made from many different, also largely waste, either sort of from a biogenic waste, also from woody residues, old tyres, tyre pyrolysis or municipal waste. But that reduces emissions by 70%. And it's a drop-in fuel, which means that actually you can use it on existing aircraft without making any engineering changes. And uh, we had the first uh, 100% SAF flight from London to New York in November, which was uh, with Virgin Airlines and Richard Branson and the Secretary of State for Transport, Mark Harper, were on board. And that was uh, fueled by used cooking oil, which had been converted by the mi- miracles of industrial chemistry into kerosene for an aeroplane. And there is already a a plant in Britain, we've got one plant that produces synthetic or sustainable aviation fuel. And so, and and around the world, there's sort of agreement that that is the sort of the, the biggest, quickest impact we can have on reducing airline emissions. And indeed, many airlines are going out of their way voluntarily before there's any legal requirement and, and buying up big contracts with SAF producers around the world because they, they do want to get to net zero. They know that it's not sustainable for them not to contribute to getting to net zero. That is the big impact. But then there's also, there's other technologies coming down the line. So I on the Jet Zero Council, this brings all the industry together. And we met last week at Cranfield and on the agenda, the main item was about the move to hydrogen power planes. In fact, there's a lot of work going on in this area about hydrogen power planes. And and indeed, we've had a hydrogen powered flight in the UK already. These are generally smaller planes at the moment, but uh, it's, is, there's a lot of work in that area, not just in the UK, but globally, although I think we probably are leading in many ways. And certainly a lot of people, you look at, if you speak to Airbus about it, for example, obviously the big European aircraft manufacturer, they're, they're doing a lot of work on, on hydrogen power planes. And certainly I think that's quite a viable option for the future, but it is longer term. It, it's not going to be the next, certainly not going to be the next decade or so until that, until that happens. And then for smaller planes, you've also got electric planes. And again, use it. this is as a result of advances in battery technology, largely driven by the the decarbonisation of road transport, whether all the car companies have been investing in better battery technology. But that the having a, a better power to weight ratio means that batteries can now be used for for small aeroplanes and indeed flying taxis, which are effectively drones but with with drivers in them or pilots in them and uh, carrying passengers. And that is now that again there's lots of companies working on that. And that's definitely a viable option for some sectors of the market. It won't be long haul at all because the batteries are way too much, but certainly it's shorter haul flights. So there's a range of different technologies coming through, which will dramatically reduce emissions from aviation. Certainly the calculations that we've done and that we've got, we've published reports on this is we reckon we can get within our net zero target of trying to get to net zero by, or the legal commitment to get to net zero by 2050, that actually we don't need to tell people to stop flying. We can do it by these existing and new technologies. Do you think there's a case to say that, yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to stop people flying at, at all. You know, I know there are people who've got res, uh, relatives abroad and it's the best way to get there, but it's cheaper for somebody to fly from London to Prague for the weekend than it is to take a train from London to Newcastle. That can't be right. There has to be something that, that needs to change about that. Now, you can, you can tell me that real fares are overpriced and, I, you know, yeah, I'll accept that. But you've got to say by the same uh, token that airfares are underpriced. And a lot of that is because aviation fuel isn't taxed. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, there are arguments about taxing aviation fuel, and, but actually it's, there's a global agreement both on aviation fuel and on maritime fuel as well, and which all countries are signed up to. It's under it's some that UN convention that means you shouldn't, you're actually not allowed to tax aviation fuel. And I mean, it is, you know, compared to other forms of transport, you're absolutely right that aviation is comparatively undertaxed, but that's, we can't change that without changing global agreement. So that, that is the policy we, we are with. But I agree it is as to why, not a mystery, but it is, you know, often perplexing that actually aviation is fl- cheaper to fly somewhere than take the trains. And we, we are, the government does spend a huge, 
huge amounts of money on trains. We are both building railways and on the, uh, the daily operations of the trains in a way that we don't with, with airlines. So there are subsidies there. And hopefully the, you know, obviously trains have had some problems recently with that reliability, but we are investing a lot in new railway lines, things like HS2, as I profile one, but there's lots of other train services that are being built out. So we've got like East-West Rail, for example, which goes from Oxford to Cambridge through my constituency and the government's committed to that. I want to loop back to the hydrogen question. Now, in the context of aviation, which is fine, but study after study after study has shown that there's no viable path for hydrogen heating and real world experience has indicated that hydrogen for road transport is pretty much a non-starter. Why is the government still pushing hydrogen as a decarbonisation solution for these areas rather than focusing it on those areas where it will be, it will be most useful, such as, for example, steel making? So we, we generally try and stay technology neutral because we don't know which technology is going to advance fastest or best. So if we'd had this conversation 10 years ago, then you'd probably be telling me that, or other people would be telling me that hydrogen is the only proper solution for, for vehicles becoming zero or close to zero emission. And indeed, I drove a hydrogen Ford car about 20 years ago broke down, unfortunately. But I remember at the time, people saying, well, hydrogen is the future. But actually, battery technology has just developed so rapidly that uh, it's clearly come out, certainly for smaller vehicles, come out the winner. We now have commercial vehicles up to 26 tonnes that are hydrogen, that are electric powered, rather battery powered, and they're on the market. We don't have them for the very heavy goods vehicles, like the 45 tonne trucks. And maybe you know, if battery technology carries on progressing in the next 10 years as it has in the last 10 years, and I think the, the very heavy trucks could end up being battery powered rather than hydrogen powered. But we, can't, we don't want to rely on those technological improvements. And so we, we, there are you know, manufacturers out there who are very interested in exploring hydrogen for heavy goods vehicles. There's also lots of other categories of a vehicle, so what we call non-road motorized machines, things like bulldozers and, and cranes and combine harvesters and so on, that, that act, and diggers that actually require huge amounts of power because of what they do. If you think about digger, they're not very often operating in areas that are not close to electricity networks. They can't recharge very easily easily. And if you speak to people like JCB, obviously, which makes a lot of diggers and so on, they're investing heavily in, in hydrogen as the solution for that. And I had a round table with manufacturers of these this sort of heavy equipment recently and with the Department for Energy Security Net Zero. And they were they're very keen on hydrogen generally. That's that seemed to be their preferred option as a as a solution for their for their particular sector. But it is it's the solutions are going to be very different for different sectors and technology will change over time. And some things that may not seem viable now become viable or some things that seem good now become, you know, become less economically viable because they're overtaken by something else. And we don't, as a government, we don't know which way it's going to go. And the other, and we can try and force and we, we can try and, encourage change and developments in a certain direction. We pay for a lot of research and development on this this department. We pay about a third of a billion pounds a year on the research projects. But also we've got the other point is we've got to be internationally coordinated because a lot of these markets and industries are very, very international. And we don't want to go down a, a route just the UK. If the rest of the world goes off in a different direction, we could end up that could be end up being very, very problematic. And I mean for ma manufacturers in the UK, but also just for people in the UK wanting to buy equipment. So an example is high-powered motorbikes, for example, where there's, at the moment there is no battery solution for them. They don't have the power-to-weight ratio. And, and, you know, question mark, what do you do over there? I'm fully in favour of people being able to drive motorbikes if they want to. But the technology at the moment doesn't exist. In, in other jurisdictions like Japan and I think in America, they're looking at hydrogen-powered motorbikes. I think I understand in Europe they're looking more towards synthetic fuel motorbikes. But we don't, given that it is that is a very international industry, a lot of the motorbikes we buy in the UK are made in Japan or the, the, the you know BMWs and so on, then we don't want to go down a route where we're stipulating there's got to be one type of motorbike where actually the, the rest of the world goes another direction. So we've got we've got to do it in tandem with 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 everyone else. We are approaching the end of our time, I realise that. So I've just got one final question for you, a little bit out of left field. I know from your webpage that you're supporting a campaign to ban the congestion charge in Cambridge. And at first glance, a decarbonisation minister actively campaigning to allow more vehicles into a city centre would seem to be counterintuitive. Talk me through your logic on that. 
So the congestion charge is not re- it's not about climate change as such because in in Cambridge they proposed one. I mean it's actually charged on on electric vehicles and indeed on mopeds and indeed on electric mopeds. It's it is actually a revenue raising scheme for to to make other transport improvements. So I think there are other ways to do that. It is. I mean, it was all, there's many other problems with it. It covered the entire city. So people living in villages outside it who go go in would have to pay five pounds a day to go to to work or and in a rural area like this. However, you're never going to improve the bus services to the level that you have in, in London, say, because there's so so many. I've got 73 small villages in my constituency, and people depend on cars to to get get out and about. And actually, five pounds a day it ends up 1,300 pounds a year out of post tax income. So, is it, if you're if you're affluent, it doesn't really make any difference to you. But the ones who are really up badly here to the low paid workers. So I remember like speaking to a care worker who had various houses that uh, she went around. And the only way to get between them all was to drive. You just can't do it on public transport. And, and you know, the prospects of her paying £1,300 a year out of post tax income was really quite horrific. So I think there's other, there's other solutions to it. And, and electric vehicles, and this is sort of comes back to one of the the points you're asking earlier about the plan for drivers that we are going towards zero emission vehicles anyway. I mean that, that is happening for as a result of it, you know getting to net zero, and um, that brings with it obviously it's better for climate change, it's better for air pollution, it's better for noise pollution, all these other benefits, and so a lot of interventions like the congestion charge really don't they don't take into account that the technology is in changing. So I'm also responsible for clean air zones. This is a, a, it's a different legal framework from the congestion charge in Cambridge, but it's we, we've got a, a legal duty to reduce air permissions for nitrogen oxides in particular. It's below a certain level and in those cities where it's above the certain level, and that's not true of Cambridge, by the way. So the, the air in Cambridge is pretty clean and it doesn't, it's within the legal limits. So again, that's why the congestion charge is not about really about air pollution because actually the air is fine in Cambridge. The But in those parts of the country where in the cities where the air pollution is above the legal limits. We introduce these things called clean air zones. We fund them. The, the central government funds them. But the local authorities come up with their solutions. Some of them come up with charging. They charge normally as lorries and vans, but sometimes they charge private drivers. And But it's only for a time-limited thing until the air pollution gets down to the legal limit. And actually, because of the expansion of electric vehicles and electric vans and electric buses, so half of new buses sold every year are zero emission now, that actually the air pollution across the country is getting better year by year. You can see it on the charts. It's improving dramatically year by year. And that's just because of the transition to zero emission vehicles, irrespective of local authorities trying to reduce traffic by charging, which is a separate, you know, which is reducing congestion is separate from reducing greenhouse gas emissions and and pollution. Well, that's all the questions I've got for you today. So, Minister, thank you very much for your time. Much appreciated. Thank you. A couple of takeaways from this discussion. It's clear that the government is focused on two key factors when it comes to the rollout of electric vehicles in the UK. Firstly, helping fund initiatives and schemes that will encourage decarbonisation in areas where private companies are not focusing. And secondly, ensuring that the money that taxpayers are putting into these schemes is not wasted or duplicated. It's also obvious that a lot of focus has been put on what schemes will bring the best bang for the buck for the government, such as the Levi Fund and the Rapid Charge Point scheme, And when schemes have run their course, they get removed, which is why the electric vehicle grant has now gone for most new vehicle purchases. But as I stated in the discussion, there are several areas where public perception is causing an issue in putting forward the best solution. VAT on public charging is one example, as is the frozen fuel duty, which costs way more than dropping the VAT on charging will ever do. Now, I understand the minister's point about rural residents needing their cars, But the cost of running a car is increasing every year. So perhaps adding in the fuel duty and using this money to encourage these rural residents to move to an electric car where possible might be a better use of public money. I also want to clarify something the minister stated. What the minister says about sustainable aviation fuel is accurate. But as with a lot of things in in this area, it can be misread or misinterpreted. SAF, Sustainable Aviation Fuel, is seen by the airlines as being the big hope moving forward. But this is literally because it's a solution which means they can continue business as normal. As the minister says, it is literally a drop in fuel which requires nothing other than a reliable source for the SAF to be provided. But research has shown that if we were to run the whole of the airline industry on sustainable aviation fuel, we'd have to transfer half the UK's agricultural land to crops to make the 
sustainable aviation fuel. It's also substantially more expensive than regular fuel, despite what we discussed with the lack of tax on aviation fuel. So this will mean airlines either go under, reduce flights, or increase airfares. Furthermore, there isn't actually a global agreement to not provide or to not tax aviation fuel as a minister states. There is a Convention on International Civil Aviation which exempts air fuels already loaded onto an aircraft on landing and which remain on the aircraft from import taxes. And there are certain bilateral agreements governing the tax exemption of airline fuels. But the EU is in the process of modifying many of these agreements, so it will be possible to tax kerosene for aviation purposes. My thanks to the Minister for his time. This interview was recorded literally a couple of hours after the late night vote on the illegal immigration bill in Parliament, so I appreciate the Minister making time for me. This season, we're looking at raising the awareness of carbon literacy with our listeners. One way we're doing that is with a carbon fact as read by carbon literacy trainer Anne Snelson. Every year, about 15 billion tonnes of fossil fuels are mined and extracted. That's 500 times more mining than a clean energy economy would require. So let's make the shift as quickly as we can. If you're swapping your car, find out about an electric vehicle. Swapping your gas boiler? Check out heat pumps or electric combi boilers instead. It's time for a cool EV or renewable thing to share with your listeners. An Australian dairy farm has installed solar panels and a battery bank at its dairy and it uses the energy from them to milk the cows. M&J O'Connor Farming has just switched on a 100 kilowatt solar system with six 13.8 kilowatt hour batteries. The power from the panels will be stored in the batteries and used in the early morning and evening to milk the cows at much reduced costs. Because the cows are usually milked before the sun rises and after it goes down, the power they're using was peak pricing and increasing bills meant something had to be done. It's hoped the system will pay for itself in five to seven years. To me, this is a critical part of the future of electricity generation and usage, being able to control when you pull power into your system and when you use that power. Bringing the power in at a cheap rate and using it at an expensive time of day will both reduce costs and help balance the grid overall. The EV Musings podcast is sponsored by ZapMap the go-to app for EV drivers in the UK, which helps that EV driver search, plan, and pay for their charging. ZapMap is free to download and use with subscription plans for enhanced features such as using ZapMap in-car, on CarPlay, or Android Auto. And that's the show for today. I hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at info at evmusings.com. I'm also on Twitter at MusingsEV. If you want to support the podcast and the newsletter, please consider contributing to becoming an EV Musing patron. The link is in the show notes. Don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis? Well, if you've enjoyed this particular episode, why not buy me a coffee? Go to coffee.com slash EV Musings and you can do just that. ko-fi.com slash EV Musings. Takes Apple Pay too. I have a couple of ebooks out there if you want something to read on your Kindle. So, you've gone electric. It's available on Amazon Worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent, and it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. If you're looking for installing solar panel storage battery in a heat pump, try So You've Gone Renewable, also available on Amazon for the same 99p. And if you've got Amazon Prime and you can use the Kindle Lending Library, you can read them for nothing. Why not check them both out? Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe. It's available on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a review. It helps raise our visibility and extend our reach in search engines. If you've reached this part of the podcast and are still listening, thank you. Why not let me know you've got to this point by tweeting me at MusingZV with the words, Yes, Minister. Hashtag if you know, you know. Nothing else. Thanks, as always, to my co-founder, Simon. You know he runs a Facebook group for his electric unicycle friends. He's quite strict about who he lets in and who he doesn't. You've got to ride a unicycle, obviously, but nowhere in the rules does it state that it has to be electric. I bought a unicycle from a circus and tried to join. And when I was refused, I asked him why. And he told me... I mean, obviously, we can always do more and we're always reviewing different policies. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.